Welcome to the American Shoulder and Elbow Surgeons Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Chalmers, a shoulder and elbow surgeon at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City. And I'm joined today by my co-host, Rachel Frank, a sports and shoulder surgeon at the University of Colorado in Denver. Rachel, how are you? Doing fantastic, Pete. How are you today? Oh, I'm doing great. Before we get started, I should mention that the views expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the views of the American Shoulder, shoulder and Elbow Surgeon Society, the University of Utah, the University of Colorado, or the institutions of any of our guests. Today, we have an episode on a topic that never fails to ignite controversy, which is the evaluation and management of slap tears and overhead throwers. We've invited two internationally round experts on the subject. First, we have Dr. Michael Sakati, who is the Chief of Sports at Rothman Institute and the head team physician for the Philadelphia Phillies. Dr. Sakati, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thank you for having me. Well, thanks for your time. Next, we have Dr. Nikhil Verma, who is the Chief of Sports at Rush University Medical Center and the head team physician for the Chicago White Sox. Dr. Verma, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Pete. I'm excited to be here. Let's start at the beginning here. So let's pretend we have a hypothetical patient. He's a collegiate pitcher. He presents your clinic with shoulder pain. Let's pretend he already has an MRI, and we can argue later on about whether or not that's appropriate, but let's pretend he does, and it shows a slap tear. So, Dr. Sakati, what questions are you going to ask this player to try and figure out how this fits into his potential symptomatology? And we'll get to physical examination in a second. Let's just start with the history. Well, I, you know, I think, Peter, that, you know, the history is certainly very important. And, I, it, it, you know, that transcends all pathology, right? We learn that when we're in medical school and through our residencies. But I think it's particularly important here with superior labral pathology and particularly with the population that we're, we're discussing. And so I, I sort of think of it in terms of, you know, where, you know, when, how, and when I say where, you know, where, where is, where is the pain that the player is experiencing? And it's, you know, is it, is it anterior, which maybe suggests more biceps, biceps pathology? Is it, is it deep or posterior, which to me is more consistent with uh, clinically significant labral issues, particularly superior labral issues? You know, when does it occur? Uh, when they're throwing mechanism, usually it's more late cocking uh, all the way through ball release. If we believe in the mechanism of like weed pulling, where it can happen through those phases of throwing, um, and then how you know how does it present to them? Is there are there mechanical symptoms like clicking or popping or catching? So I think those those three things are are uh, really important uh, to ask these athletes. And then I also think I, I'm sure Nick has similar thoughts on this, but you know have they had any prior history of injury and have, and what kind of treatment have they had to this point? What are your thoughts, Dr. Verma? What, what, what factors do you find important in, in, in your initial discussions with this player? Yeah, I think uh, Mike hit all of the, the key ones on the head. Uh, the only other thing that I would comment on is that the last thing I want to know is how does it affect them? Meaning, is it affecting their ability to generate velocity? Are they having trouble positioning the ball? Is it sore during throwing to the point where they, they aren't able to to continue to participate? Is it sore after throwing? And how does it relate to the way that their shoulder normally feels? So I think sometimes the decisions that we need to make are based on how serious the, the symptomatology is and that it's the way that it affects the player's performance. And can I just, I would just add, Nick, I think that's a great point uh, because when these players come to us and if they're not, if their function is not really altered, you know, if their velocity is not diminished, if their control is not affected, it's probably a, a less significant injury. But if they start to, if their performance is affected, adversely affected, if their velocity is decreased or their control is really off or less precise, you know, don't you think it's more, that's a, that's a more significant issue for us to consider? Yeah, no question. I mean, I think it, it speaks to the potential, the severity of the, of the issue that they're having, but also it changes the way that we may recommend management for that player and how aggressive we are, for example, in doing things like an MRI. I know Peter mentioned that this player already had an MRI scan, but those are factors that I think go into our decision making regarding the next steps in the management routine. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the other thing I would say is really important too, is uh, getting a granular about the kind of treatment that they've had. You know, often they'll just come and they'll, they'll say that, oh yeah, you know, I, I, I've had some non-operative treatment. And, you know, I've rested it. And, and you really, I think you really have to delve into that. Like, what does that mean? And when you say rest, you know, how long was it, you know, how long ago did you stop throwing? Was it three days or was it six weeks? And, you know, have you had any substantive treatment? Have you been on any 
any NSAIDs, you know, any prescription anti-inflammatories? Have you gotten any injections? And if you've had rehab, like what kind of rehab was it? Was it just shoulder focused? Was it, did it include your kinetic chain? I mean, I think those, those are really important questions to ask these athletes because so often they come in and like Nick, you just said, they come in armed with a study and they have a, you know, a mindset, but they may not have really truly failed non-operative treatment because they never really had any non-operative treatment? Yeah, and I, th I think one of the toughest problems, um, and, and you can comment on this, Dr. Sakati, is the fact that we get spoiled by treating players at the, the minor league and major league level because we know almost everything that's happened to them. You know, we've got a chronology and a history from the trainers and the people who have been seeing them, you know, how they've been performing, their pitch count, all of those things are spelled out for us. But the reality is the younger they are and, quote, unquote, the more amateur they are, the more you have to probe into those questions. Because most of these kids are trying to rehab in the backyard with dad. And right. their view of not throwing is markedly different than your view of not throwing. Or their view of rehab when they went to, you know, the place down the street is markedly different than what we may consider the appropriate uh, rehab. So I think that, uh, you know, as we get to these younger players, we have to be really descriptive about our questions and proscriptive about our recommendations. Great. Let's move on to the physical exam. Dr. Verma, what maneuvers do you find to be most helpful to determine, even if you have an MRI diagnosis of a slap tear, if, it, if that slap tear is symptomatic for that particular picture? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, Rachel. And I would just take a step back and say that I'm not sure that a, an MRI diagnosis of a slap tear exists just to start with, but but we'll, I'm sure we'll cover that as we get into uh, the later discussion. But I think the first thing is to understand that, that it's probably not about specific maneuvers, although they play a role. It's about comprehensively evaluating the shoulder because there, there are so many things that can present a shoulder pain. And in my opinion, many of these things end up in the same sequelae, even though they come from very different places. So I think you start by always having the players shirt off. Fortunately, with the overhead thrower, the majority of time we're dealing with men, so you can just ask them to remove their shirts. But we see this in volleyball uh, players and other athletes where you need them in a sports bra or you need them in a, in a gown where you can keep the opening to the back. You want to take a good look at them. You're looking for asymmetry in the muscular structures. Um, and often in these unilateral athletes, you'll see significant asymmetry of their scapula or uh, asymmetry in their trape trapezius, which may need to be addressed. A comprehensive core examination, Dr. Scotty already mentioned that, but that's critical. You know, many of these younger players don't understand that, that the majority of their performance and velocity is actually generated by the lower body and that compensatory motions with lower body weakness is going to change the way that they pitch and, and alter their mechanics. <clears throat> the next thing that I like to do is range of motion because what I find is that for many of these players, one of the early signs of a problem is their shoulders, they start to get tight and they lose motion. And that's really the kiss of death for an overhead throwing athlete. So you want to get a sense of what is their normal uh, motion for them and how has it been affected and are they tight in rotation? And I think we've gotten away from this comment or this concept of just internal rotation loss rather than global rotation loss, even though most of these players will have a shift towards external rotation. Um, we touched on the fact that anterior shoulder pain can be biceps, it can be AC joints, so you need to palpate those areas. And then for me, when it really comes down to slap testing, it's some form of load and rotational maneuver. So the two that I like are the active compression test and the O'Brien test, which is the cross-body adduction resisted with the thumb up and the thumb down position. And then I like a version of a crank test where you're literally putting them into a cocking position and trying to elicit symptoms most commonly in the posterior superior aspect of the shoulder that traditionally represent, in my mind, slap pain, so to speak. Yeah. I mean, Nick, you've you've so perfectly outlined the approach to these these athletes. I agree with you completely, uh, and the importance of comparing side to side, knowing though that that there will be differences, and we expect them to be be different uh, from side to side. Uh, and I think you know, palpating the areas that that you've mentioned, you know, the AC joint, and particularly the AC joint, the bicipital groove, the posterior joint line. Uh, their range of motion assessing, as you've already uh, identified. And then when it comes down to specific tests, uh, there are just a host of tests that have been proposed for superior labral pathology. And there are studies, good studies, that have suggested strongly that there's no single test or combination of tests that reliably predicts a superior labral tear. Now, having said that, uh, 
I do agree with Nick. I think that that uh, those tests that load in some manner or create a translational force across the labrum, the superior and posterior superior labrum, are most effective for me. So I agree. I, I like to do, and, and I'm confident in the uh, active uh, compression test or the O'Brien's test. And I also like the modified dynamic labral shear test that Ben Kibler has talked about, which is basically loading them in that abducted, externally rotated position. And um, in fact, Ben Kibler published a, a study looking closely at uh, 300 plus patients with shoulder pain and shoulder pathology and correlating it with uh, arthroscopically identified labral pathology. and uh, for superior labral tears uh, felt that the active compression test and the modified dynamic labral shear test were the, the most uh, accurate in terms of diagnosing clinically significant labral pathology. Uh, and I think those in my hands are, are most effective. For me, we did a survey of uh, Major League Baseball Team Physicians Association several years ago, and those two were the most consistent tests that were utilized by Major League Team Physicians. One thing I will add, though, which is a nuance that I have just personally found has been helpful for me, those tests were originally described uh, in either a standing or a, you know, a seated position. And I prefer to do them in a supine position where I feel like the scapula is stabilized or I can control the scapula a little bit better. And it's more of a glenohumeral motion that I'm assessing. Um, and that's just been helpful in, in, in my hands. Yeah, the only other comment I would make, and, and uh... Uh, Dr. Sakata, you talked, you touched on this is the fact that we expect to see differences in range of motion. And frankly, it's when you don't see the differences in range of motion that you start to get really concerned because uh, players that are struggling with a shoulder issue will often suddenly start to lose motion and they should have a shift towards external rotation in their throwing shoulder. If they don't have uh, beyond 90 degrees and in many cases between 100 and 110 degrees of external rotation, they're not going to be effective. They just can't generate velocity on the ball from a typical 90-90 position. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing I look at is to make sure that that external rotation, adaptive external rotation that you expect from an overhand thrower is present. Um, and then the other thing that I think is important is understanding that, as, as uh, Mike pointed out, you know, these tests, unfortunately, are very overlapping with other common shoulder pathologies. So an O'Brien sign or an active compression test will be positive with AC joint pain. It'll be positive with a rotator mm -hmm. cuff. Uh, pathology. So they're, they're, the problem with slaps is that whether you talk about history, whether you talk about physical exam, whether you talk about imaging, there are so many overlapping diagnoses that exist is that it really becomes the challenge in how do we diagnose a symptomatic slap versus everything else that can affect a throwing shoulder. I mean, Nick said some really important things there. Uh, you know, the, you do those tests and certainly there are various pathologies that can give us a, a possible positive result in those tests. But that's where I think, as Nick has suggested, you know, correlating not just that the test causes some type of symptom, but also the location of that, that symptom. So, you know, in general, clinically significant labral pathology, superior, posterior, superior labral pathology will cause deep and posterior pain. So if you do an, you know, O'Brien's test and it's causing anterior discomfort, you know, is that AC joint or is it, you know, the long head of the biceps, maybe more likely, right? So, so it's, as Nick has said, puzzling together those types of, of tests to, to really have the sun and the moon and the stars line up from a physical exam point that, that all will point to and then to superior labral pathology and the other comment I would make, too, is that we tend to be myopic. We tend to think just about the glenohumeral joint. We also obviously need to think about the, the scapula, but even beyond that, and I think some type of assessment of kinetic chain is, is important. It's hard to do that in an office, you know, a busy office setting, and how do you thoroughly do that? At a professional level, you know, we can work with our, our athletic training staff and strength and conditioning coaches to do functional movement screens and you know, thorough evaluations. But in my hands, a simple single, single leg squat test is a way to just get a sense of what an athlete is like, you know, from the core downward, just having them squat on each leg. And, you know, that athlete that has a reasonable degree of kinetic chain balance uh, will be able to stand on a single leg and do a squat. But if there's corkscrewing or tilting, it's just an indication that maybe there's something kinetic chain wise that needs to be considered. And I will also say it's a really helpful way to get a an athlete and or the athlete's uh, family and coaches to buy into this concept of, of 
the kinetic chain being part of the problem. So we've danced around imaging a little bit, and I, I purposely tried to get us away from that discussion until now. So let's pretend same hypothetical player, collegiate pitcher shoulder pain, does not yet have an MRI. Let's talk about what are the indications for imaging beyond x-rays? What scan are you getting? What are you looking for? Is this helpful to us or does it lead us astray? I mean, I think I should lead here with one of my favorite quotes from Jimmy Andrews, which is if you want to operate on a baseball player, get an MRI because you're going to find something. So what are your thoughts, Sakati? When, when, when are you getting the MRI? What are the indications? What, is, what use does it have for you here? Yeah, so, so Peter, as, you, as I'm sure you would agree, I'm sure Rachel and Nick would agree too. I mean, the large majority of these athletes, you know, they'll come to you with an imaging study already, right? So it's sort of handed to you. Uh, but I think that, you know, if they don't come with it, uh, if, if their exam is consistent, so the things we've talked about, their history and their physical exam is indicating some type of, you know, clinically significant labral injury. Uh, and maybe they've had some degree of appropriate non-operative treatment and their symptoms so they have symptoms that are that are impacting their lives, whether it's work or 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 sport or sleep or all three of them. Then I think it's reasonable to get you know an, an imaging study. You know, at an, at an elite level, you know, it's it, it's so the trigger is pulled so quickly on that on getting imaging studies, and I would think that Nick would would agree with that as well. Um, so I th I think that's sort sort of the indications in my mind that you know, they have an exam that's and a history that's consistent. They have symptomatology that's effect, like truly affecting their lives, uh, and and maybe they failed some non-operative treatment. I think it's reasonable to to pull the trigger on an on an imaging study. Nick, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I would I would echo your comments. <laughs> I would say there are probably four different things that I think about. Number one is the level of play, and obviously as the stakes get higher, our our desire, let's call it, to um, get an imaging study increases because. Now we're not only making decisions about how are we going to treat this player going forward, but we also need some prognostic information about what to expect, time loss, you know, roster decisions have to be made, uh, sometimes contract decisions have to be made. And the other beautiful thing about the level that we take care of is uh, the fact that we often have a pre-injury MRI to compare to, which is really the gold standard for me in terms of making decisions about these, uh, about these athletes. So the level of play is, is a big one. The second one is kind of what are the types of symptoms that they're having? So if they're having mechanical symptoms, certainly if there's any instability type quality to it or a significant severity of symptoms would prompt me to get an MRI pretty early. Mike mentioned the conservative approach. And the reality is for many of these garden variety, quote unquote, flap tears, internal impingement, however you want to characterize it, even with an MRI diagnosis of a slap, we're going to try conservative care. So I'll often try to talk the younger athletes out of an MRI scan because I know it's going to raise more problems than it's going to solve just because mom or dad or the athlete or the coach or whoever is going to get a list of three or four things on an MRI report and, and think that the sky is falling. Um, and then finally, obviously, the physical exam, if I see something that's really suggestive of a, of a significant labral pathology with you know either mechanical catching or those types of things, that may prompt me to get uh, an MRI scan early. But I would say that in a native shoulder, young amateur athlete, sore shoulder for a week or two, I, I, would, I know that even with an MRI scan, I'm likely, more likely than not, to consider a conservative approach. I'll just go down that road first before jumping into the MRI scan. My, in my opinion, the MRI scan for the non-professional, non-collegiate athlete is a pre-surgical study. I, Nick, I agree completely. And I, and I begin my review of the MRI with these patients by saying that we know that asymptomatic uh, changes exist in certain populations, particularly throwing athletes. I mean, there, there are multiple studies that show that 30, 40, 50 percent of asymptomatic throwing athletes will have changes on an MRI that really have no clinical significance. So I begin that, the conversation or the review of the, of the MRI with, with that in, in, in mind and in that explanation. And then I think the thing we often talk about, we debate from an academic standpoint is, you know, do we enhance them with gadolinium or not? There are absolutely centers in the United States that feel strongly that, that uh, you don't need to enhance these. I would say the majority of, of uh, physicians that take care of uh, overhead or throwing athletes and, and the institutions are in, 
believe that that intraarticular gadolinium or, or, or enhancement can help you identify some of these more subtle changes that are occurring, uh, particularly in the labrum. Nick, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I agree. I think if I had my choice and I said, you get one study, um, I would do an arthrogram. As you know, uh, Mike, the, the problem with the arthrogram is it, it shuts a, a player down for a certain right. period of time as well. And right. so sometimes we, we choose not to do arthrograms, particularly at a, at a major league level, because we're looking at timing issues and start issues and those types of things, assuming the player is able to, to continue to participate. Um, and the other thing that I found very helpful in these athletes is the ABER view, which is the abduction yes. external rotation view which really mimics the pathology of internal impingement. So you get a great look at the undersurface of the posterior superior cuff. You can see how the cuff articulates with the labrum. You can often see peel back type phenomenon. So that to me has been a very useful view in helping to make decisions and to evaluate the entirety of the spectrum of, uh, of the throwing shoulder pathology. Cause it's not just the labrum in most of these cases. It's a variety of different pathologies that come together to lead to decompensation that renders the shoulder symptomatic. Yeah, great. I think I agree with you completely. I mean, asking or requesting, you usually have to request an ABER view, but making our, some institutions it's standard, but, but often you have to request it. I think that's so important looking at posterior superior cuff pathology. And I think also not just focusing on the superior labrum, but looking towards the, the, the posterior labrum because so many of these injuries extend into the posterior labrum. And I, I think certain things help me, you know, contrast that's undercutting the superior labrum either at or posterior to the bicipital root for two, three, four millimeters. If you see detachment or lifting up of the superior labrum, you know, perilabral cysts, you know, irregular borders along the labrum. I think these are some of the, the uh, radiographic clues that help me to determine what might be a clinically significant labral injury. Dr. Verma, one of the things you mentioned was if you have one of these younger athletes and they don't necessarily have an MRI, potentially trying to avoid getting that MRI, you know, based on their history and, and what you suspect might be going on. For our young listeners out here, many of whom are in their first few years in practice, um, they might, you know, the easy answer is often just to get the MRI. Many times parents or coaches or trainers are demanding it. Um, and the patient doesn't want to leave the office without that script for the MRI if they don't already have the image. Uh, but then, and the easy answer at that time is to just get the MRI because then you get them out of the office and, and they leave happy and everyone's happy. But then you suffer when you have to explain the nonspecific slap tear report diagnosis on their, on their radiology report. And that becomes a much longer conversation. Do you have any tips for trying to let the patient or the parents or the coach know why you're not getting the MRI or why you don't think it's important when so many times, you know, the, the athletes just demanding it, that's what they come for. And that's what they want. Yeah. I think, I think it goes back to what um, Mike commented on, which is the first thing you have to do is educate whoever's in the room with you, including the athlete and their representatives, whether that's parents, trainers, et cetera, about um, the throwing shoulder. And the fact is that an MRI scan is not going to be normal, uh, that the MRI scan is going to show predictable changes that we normally associate with a throwing shoulder, that many of these changes are adaptive rather than pathologic, and that many of these changes are irrelevant in terms of their ability to, to rehab or recover from this injury and return to sport and enjoy a, a healthy and, and durable career. So that's number one, is that you got to spend a little time in terms of educating in, of them about your decision making and why. The second thing that I do is just help them to understand that, you know, many of them come in thinking that the label surgery or I need a repair or I'm going to have something done and it's a quick fix. And, and they really need to understand the severity of shoulder injury to the, of, excuse me, of shoulder surgery to the throwing athlete. And the fact that their goal and your goal and the trainer's goal and mom and dad's goal should be to do everything possible to keep that kid or athlete out of the the operating room because the operating room is the last place you want to be if you've got a, a shoulder problem with a throwing athlete because the reality is six out of ten of them will get back but four out of ten probably won't on a good day and so I think once they understand the gravity of the situation and the fact that it's in their interest to avoid a surgery and that the MRI is probably not going to help you in terms of making that decision early on assuming the rest of the criteria that we talked about uh, fall into place uh, they, they will often um, understand your rationale as to why you don't think an MRI is helpful at this point. Let's talk about conservative treatment. Dr. Scotty, let's go to you. Let's say you've got a patient. Um, he, it's an overhead thrower, male pitcher. He's got what you think is a symptomatic 
slap tear. What are your non-operative treatments if, if they haven't done anything other than potentially take some time off throwing? Um, and, and that may or may not be formal time off throwing, but they, they say they've been resting. Is there any role for steroid injection or other intra-articular or extra-articular injection in these players? Um, or, you know, is everyone with a symptomatic slap tear going to surgery? So your, your question is a great question. And we talked a little bit about this earlier. I think asking the athlete very carefully in a granular way, what type of treatment they've had and what, what they would define as non-operative treatment, because so often they think they've had non-operative treatment and they, they, they think they've failed non-operative treatment, but really they, they just haven't given it an appropriate chance. And so I think there are principles that are important. Number one, you already alluded to it rest. So that means no throwing not just going out in your backyard and kind of tossing a little bit, testing it every other day, like sort of picking the scab repeatedly, you know, no throwing, minimum of three to six weeks. I do think there's a role for non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, and we prefer the single dose, uh, daily dose anti-inflammatories because patients are just more compliant with them. So if they have a medical history that allows them to, which most of them do, we'll give them a two-week course of a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. I think injections, corticosteroid injections, are both with a local anesthetic are both helpful diagnostically and and more importantly therapeutically. So it helps us to kind of define if we have that confusing physical exam that might have a combination of AC joint biceps, long head of biceps pathology, maybe labrum. So to give them a corticosteroid injection to help identify with a local that is to identify selectively the, the pathology site, but also to help them from an inflammatory standpoint. Yes, we'll do that early on while, while they're resting. Uh, and then not being myopic and not just thinking, you know, just about the rotator cuff, but thinking beyond that, the, the, certainly the rotator cuff, the, the scapula, scapular positioning, uh, the larger muscles in the shoulder girdle, and then the entire kinetic chain, as we've already talked about, and, and, and connecting them with someone that is knowledgeable, a rehab specialist, whether it's an athletic trainer, a strength and conditioning coach, a physical therapist uh, that, that's knowledgeable about kinetic chain uh, assessment and, and enhancement, and then re-examining them. So examining them to see where they're at, at at three weeks down the road or four weeks or six weeks. And if, they're, if, they're, if they have full range of motion you know, uh, or, or comparable to what they have defi- would define as pre-injury range of motion, uh, and if they have no provocative testing, uh, then progressing them. So that doesn't mean like just having them go out and throw a bullpen, uh, considering the, the three things that they do as a, as a baseball player, obviously throwing. So progressing them from short toss to long toss, and then a position player's done. We could debate how far out they go, if it's 180 feet, 200 feet. And then a pitcher goes to the mound and essentially throws fastballs first uh, with increasing effort and then off-speed pitches. So a progression, but they also bat. Right. So, so dry swings, um, uh, T work, uh, gentle front toss, then live hitting and BP. So again, progressing them and then finally fielding, you know, having balls hit right to the player and then having the player, uh, having balls hit throughout that player's whole position. So full positioning. And I think the idea through all three of those is just gradually progressing them. And, and if they go through that methodically, then that's a really thorough non-operative program in my mind. Yeah, I would echo those comments. I kind of look at it in three phases. Phase one is you've got to get them asymptomatic, which means you've got to get the inflammatory process or the pain generator shut off. And that's a combination of rest, um, anti-inflammatory medications. uh, And I'm very quick to use injections, uh, whether that's glenohumeral, subacromial, biceps, AC joint, based on your examination. I think they have great value both therapeutically, but can help you in terms of identifying potential sources of pathology and confirming what you are thinking is the source of pain based on your exam and, and if you have imaging then using it. Once the player is asymptomatic, um, then we've got to work on correcting any deficiencies that we've identified. So if there's cores weak, you've got to fix that. If their scapula is out of position, you've got to fix that. If their range of motion is deficient, you've got to get it back. If their cuff is deficient, you've got, you got to fix that. So whatever abnormalities you've identified have to be corrected back to what's quote unquote a baseline normal status. And then, then once they're there, they're asymptomatic, they've got a normal exam, uh, then it's a throwing progression. And as Mike said, you know, you don't go from zero to 100. It's generally the amount of time you've been shut down is the amount of time it's going to take you to ramp back up. 
Um, and then the last thing that we do that we've started to use more and more is just biomechanical analyses, just really looking critically at their throwing mechanics and helping to understand if there are certain areas that can be corrected from a from a mechanical standpoint or a a um, you know a pitching standpoint that that may be causative in regards to some of their pain that they're having. And then the last thing I would just reiterate, and, and Mike touched on this, is the fact that this is a very specific rehabilitation protocol, and it really is a very specific examination, and it does take an understanding of the throwing shoulder in terms of the pathology and the way that rehab progression needs to happen in order to be successful. And so what we've done here and what I would recommend for the young guys who are listening or gals that are listening who are one or two, three years into their career is make a list of quote unquote throwing experts in your area, people that you would trust to be able to say, I know that if this therapist or this strength and conditioning coach or, or you know, this throwing person has looked at this player and says, we've done what we can and we've been unsuccessful, that I feel comfortable that the right things have been done and it's time to move on to the next step. Once, I agree completely, Nick, with what you've said. And I would emphasize uh, further, I think something that's practical and that's helpful, helpful not just to the, you know, to other physicians that are taking care of this, but also to the athlete and the athletes, coaches and, and, and athletic trainers is that, um, you know, if you, if you hold them off from throwing for four weeks, you know, it's probably going to take them about another four weeks to ramp up, particularly a pitcher, to be game ready. If you hold them off from throwing for six weeks, it's going to be another six weeks. So non-operative treatment is not, you know, it's not days. Good, thorough non-operative treatment for superior labral pathology uh, is, is two months, three months. Don't you agree, Nick? Yeah, totally. All right, so let's let's pretend you, you have this player now and they've worked with that therapist or strength and conditioning coach that you trust and there's nothing more that can done. They failed conservative treatment. So let's talk, you know, you're, you're at the end of the line. You've decided that you're going to, you're going to go, you're going to go to surgery. Let's talk about the surgery here for a second. And I, I want to talk before we talk about what you do in the operating room, about your approach to the operating room, about the decisions you make before surgery, about whether you're going to likely do debridement versus repair whether or not you're going to do the biceps. So Dr. Verma, talk to us a little bit about how do you make those decisions in the office? What are the, what are the, 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 the pieces of information you're using to make that preoperative plan for that player? So I think the first thing, Pete, is as you said, you know, you, you have to be confident and comfortable and the player has to be confident and comfortable that every potential avenue to avoid a surgery has been exhausted. Because when you take that player to the operating room, as I've already touched down, you know, three or four out of 10 are not going to pitch again or not pitch at the same level or be as successful as they were before. So in my mind, the surgical solutions for shoulder pathology and the overhead last leap are the absolute end of the road. So I, I, I can't emphasize that enough. And that's something that we discussed from our 14-year-old our to our, um, you know, 32-year-old major league thrower is this is the end of the line. We've tried everything. I'm comfortable we've tried everything. The trainer's comfortable we've tried everything. Mom and dad are comfortable we've tried everything. The player's comfortable we've tried everything. So that's number one. Secondly is I think you need to have a, in your mind an idea of where the pathology is coming from. So is the bicep symptomatic and what's going to be your threshold for moving it if you find it to be abnormal? Is the AC joint symptomatic? Do you think there's a component of cuff pathology or external impingement? Um, but the vast majority of these are some combination of labral undersurface rotator cuff pathology. And in my mind, you know, we kind of vacillate between favoring repair, favoring debridement. And I think what we've recognized is that the importance of knowing where you think the pathology is coming from is that you may encounter a number of incidental findings at the time of surgery. And the problem is the kiss of death for these athletes is if you, if you relegate them to a motion loss situation. And the more you do, the more likely it is that they're going to have trouble regaining their motion. And if they don't get their motion back, as we know is common with shoulder pathology and surgery, they're not throwing again. So your, your goal is to really get in and get out, take care of what you think is the acute symptomatic stuff, and leave all of the in, incidental stuff that may be coexisting in the shoulder alone. And that's where your physical exam really comes in. You know, I'm, I'm a big guy, uh, a big fan of debridements. I think whenever possible, they're helpful. I think the things I look for in the superior labrum is gross instability of the labrum itself. And particularly, as, as uh, Mike mentioned earlier, extension of the labrum beyond just the superior region 
generally going down the back side of the shoulder below the equator. Those are the ones that I think actually have trouble with centering of the humerus on the glenoid and probably need to be repaired versus the true just flaps and cracks in the superior labrum with undersurface rotator cuff pathology where probably a debridement may be sufficient. Dr. Scotty, I want to hear your thoughts, but before we move on from this, because this is something I've struggled with in the operating room, you mentioned when you get extension posteriorly, where is the line? Like, do you have an intraoperative landmark you use? Is it the bare spot? You know, is it something to do with the cuff or the head? When do you say this tear is extended too far around the back and I need to repair this person? So uh, I'm assuming that you're, you're considering the fact that there is a, a superior labral I mean, tear or superior labral damage. So if there's, superior, if there's an injury to the, at, the, at the base of the biceps, so the superior labrum at the base of the biceps posteriorly, so uh, three millimeters, five millimeters, uh, if it has a, if there's a constellation of findings, what I mean by that is that uh, if there's more than several millimeters of exposed non-articular glenoid, uh, if it lifts off more than three to five millimeters, uh, it, in in the operating room, you know, I, I prefer to do it in a, a lateral decubitus position, and I find it easy to rem- you take the arm out uh, of the arm holder and put them in an abducted externally rotated position. Is there peel back or shifting, lifting off and rolling back of the um, superior and posterior superior labrum off the glenoid rim? So these are the, some of the things in the operating room, and, and Nick's already alluded to them, that make me feel that this is uh, an unstable superior labrum and posterior superior labrum that's that I feel needs to be addressed with repair rather than, rather than just debridement. But also it's beyond those things. It's also the quality of the tissue. Um, you know, is it, is it a tissue that really you can do a repair on and the majority of the time, the play, these players, these young athletes do have substantive labral tissue, but as you make your way around posteriorly, we know that the, the posterior labrum becomes more diminutive and sometimes there's more fraying in that area. So sometimes there's a combination that you'll do of, a, you know, a repair in the posterior superior zone, and then you may end up debriding part of the posterior labrum. Yeah, Peter, remember at the beginning when we said we were going to ask you the question when we didn't know the answer, this is the time when that happens. And I, I think this is the problem with treating these lesions operatively is, is we just don't have great um, decision-making capabilities other than, you know, what, what you see on that day and what you think is in the best interest of, of the yeah. player. And, you know, frankly, we probably sometimes get it wrong. I mean, I think if it extends below the equator, for me, that's too much. Uh, but, you know, in those 10, 11 o'clock regions, or as, as um, uh, Mike was saying, you know, the peel back phenomenon and those types of things, I would venture to guess that many players, if you put them to sleep and put a scope in, would have a peel back because it allows them to generate that external, external rotation that they need to get to. And so the answer is, I don't know, um, but I use all of the criteria that Mike suggested to try to make the best decision that I can. And if I'm on the fence, I generally lean towards doing less rather than doing more. Mm-hmm. So I would add, Peter, though, I mean, I think what you're alluding to is this idea of is what we see symptomatic? You know, what's the difference between a good slap, which is just a, you know, it's a, it's a progression uh, of, of changes that allow this athlete to perform at the highest level? And when does it, when, what's the tide mark, right? What's the tipping point when it becomes a bad slap or as I've been saying, a clinically significant labral injury. And I think that's really hard to discern, but Nick has already you know, alluded to the fact that it's, it's a, you know, a gestalt we get when we, 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 we don't go the, the, the OR and what we find in the OR really helps to solidify our decision-making. I mean, beforehand we have a history, we have a, physical constellation of physical exam findings. We may have imaging that does indicate um, what we think is clinically significant labral pathology. And then they've failed that non-operative treatment, that overhead athlete that has persistent symptoms, and they, they had an exam and a physical exam and imaging findings that were consistent, and then they failed non-operative treatment, um, and you've optimized their kinetic chain, their other uh, deficits. So what all those things, like sun and the moon and the stars line up, as I said earlier, uh, and then what you see in the operating room, and you find pathology there, then that's most likely a bad actor. That's most likely a clinically significant labral injury. And I would just add one final thing, as Nick has said a couple times, often less is more. 
often less is more because constraining a shoulder, and we'll get into this with technique now, uh, constra- constraining a shoulder is you could do a beautiful labor repair, but if you constrain their shoulder, I mean, they're not going to be, they're not going to be pitching at an elite level. They'll be, they'll be playing in the backyard. Let's, let's say that you have decided that you want to perform a repair. You've made that decision using whatever criteria, whether it's three to five millimeters or peel back or whatever criteria you're using that we all can agree is very difficult to, to determine for ourselves individually. And certainly, you know, as a group, but say you've decided to repair, what is your technique of choice? Dr. Verma, let's start with you. Um, if you're doing a labor repair, are you doing anchors, knotless anchors? Are you going around, um, both sides of the biceps? What's your technique of choice for, you know, most of your overhead athletes where you feel like you have to repair the labrum? Yeah, so I'll, I'll make a couple comments. Number one is I think uh, the first step is to make sure you prepare well. Uh, it's a relatively avascular or devascular area, and you're, you're very dependent on the bleeding from the bone to help with your healing. So I think an, an adequate preparation using, I use a 3.8 bone cutting uh, shaver to help me uh, to, to access that area. Number two is whatever you're going to do, you got to stay out of the superior capsule because a lot of the issues that I think occur, at least in my opinion, are when you violated the superior capsule or you've incorporated the superior capsule into your repair uh, and you get scarring in that superior glenoid interval that, again, as as we pointed out a couple times now, ends up with a restriction of motion. Number three is, although we haven't been able to show this uh, scientifically just because of the variability and techniques and indications, et cetera, I really do believe that our transition to knotless implants has been very helpful for managing these labral pathologies because at the end of the day, there is going to be contact between the articular surfaces and the rotator cuff in your repair. And so the less abnormal stuff you have there, the better um, and a smoother gliding surface. That's what I'm always thinking about when I'm doing this is how do I create a smooth interface on which the humeral head can articulate and the undersurface of the rotator cuff can articulate. And I'm a big fan of using now all suture anchors. I think they're strong enough. I think they're very low profile. They allow us to drill very small holes. And I use a lot of percutaneous portals from the Port of Wilmington uh, down to a a posterior percutaneous 7 o'clock portal to get me in the right position. Um, I try to stay posterior to the biceps, so I won't won't absolutely rule out going anterior. Sometimes they do have a labral detachment that occurs anterior. You've got to be sure that you're differentiating that from a superior labral foramen. And you've got to be very cautious in the anterior co- compartment that if you think it needs to go there, and again, to me, that's based on making sure that I'm, I'm keeping the head centered and that it, leaving an untreated anterior labral portion of the pathology is not going to allow for abnormal translation. And when I do that, I, I, I make sure to grab labrum only, avoiding coracohumeral and superior humeral ligament that will restrict external rotation. So those are kind of the concepts that I think about in terms of how to try to manage this. Nick, I think you're spot on, and I agree completely. Using you know small transmuscular portals, uh, meticulously prepping the superior glenoid and posterior superior glenoid rim with care not to change the contour of it, but to prep it, and we'll turn off the inflow, turn on suction, and to really show that we we have a vascular response. You know, low profile implants. Uh, we we currently use uh, knotless implants, uh, putting them in their variety of mattress type configurations that allow you to avoid the capsule. And I don't think you can overemphasize the importance of avoiding the capsule in these throwing athletes. Um, and um, you know, I think those are important aspects of this. Uh, and then addressing the concomitant pathology, which you already alluded to, that most often is posterior superior cuff pathology. That that the majority of the time requires some degree of debridement, and that's usually sufficient. Yeah, just remember, keep in mind for, for um, those out there that maybe are doing label surgery frequently, but maybe not in the overhead athlete. This is very different than an instability repair, where you're, you're actually happy to restrict motion to some degree because you need to make them stable. So it, the, the approach is a different mentality compared to inferior labral surgery, where you're typically dealing with an unstable shoulder. Yeah. One thing I would add in that point, too, is that uh, there are absolutely a, a, a lot of shoulder surgeons who recommend closing their portals, particularly the posterior portals. And, and I would say that for us in these throwing athletes, we actually don't do that. I, I, I haven't closed posterior portals. I, don't, I truly don't think that I've had any adverse effects from it. And I am really focused on, on you know, the capsular part of this and, and am concerned about anything that might constrain the capsule. 
So let's talk a little bit about the biceps. Um, Dr. Vermine, you know, I've been fortunate enough to work with you a little bit in this area, and I know you, you've done decades of careful research to understand the function of the biceps and the throwing motion. So tell me, do you do you hesitate to attend a tenodesis? When do you do the tenodesis? How are you doing the tenodesis in these throwers? Is it, is it the same as in your typical uh, in your typical athlete? Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to preface this by saying this is strictly my opinion, and the science is still very controversial on this topic, but but I address it as follows. Number one is I like to carefully examine the biceps in the preoperative setting, including an ultrasound-guided in, injection, to help establish whether I think the biceps is a part of the pain symptomatology. And unfortunately, what we see is that sometimes the biceps can be secondarily symptomatic, even though it's structurally normal, simply because of the alternate pathology that's going on in the shoulder. So I think we've all seen the lipstick sign that's reflective of inflammatory disease in the shoulder, but not necessarily reflective of biceps pathology. This is the one area where I still am cautious about making a decision to take the biceps, but I don't think I'm as reluctant to take the biceps as maybe um, some others uh, have spoken about. And, and I truly believe that the biceps, that you can probably still be functional, including in an overhand throwing athlete, uh, even absent of biceps. It's interesting, we've had two players now in the past couple of years in the White Sox organization who have had traction-related complete musculoskeletal nerve palsies, meaning they had absolutely zero functionality of their biceps. Um, one of them came back and, and was pitching successfully with 30% biceps recovery. Another one came back and was pitching successfully 97 miles an hour with 47% biceps recovery. So that helps me to feel more comfortable maybe with uh, N equals two that I'm somewhat correct in thinking that the biceps doesn't play a major role. I know it's anecdotal evidence only, but I can say that at the at the minor league level and below, we've had success with tenodesis when indicated in getting players back to sport. I think that the data still needs to be accumulated at higher level throwing. Um, but if I think it's part of the pathology and it looks like it's part of the pathology at the time of a surgery, and I'm convinced that removing it is the right answer, I won't hesitate to do that. I would say that it's still the minority of players, in my opinion, that that need that as a primary approach. Nick, I agree with you completely. I mean, that's perfect. And I think that preoperatively, you really have to be meticulous and assess uh, you know, the, the biceps. Is, is the biceps a pain generator uh, in, this, in this athlete? And selective injections under ultrasound guidance can really help you to define that. And then does the biceps have structural abnormality or structural damage that would then uh, perhaps um, result in a consideration of, of doing something surgically to it. And I think those are hard questions sometimes to answer, but important to think about beforehand. And I, I really do believe that the biceps is functionally important in the throwing shoulder. I mean, it's, it's you know, it, it's optimizes glenohumeral stability from cocking through ball release. It's a humeral head depressor. It stabilizes a, a superior labrum that we know can be mobile. Uh, it, it certainly potentiates that the glenohumeral concavity compression. So I think it is important, important to important to preserve it. But having said that, um, there are athletes that have severe biceps damage. They have longitudinal splits. They have high grade partial tears uh, that that are not always even in the joint. That can be in in the bicipital groove that um, go well beyond you know non operative treatment or even selective injections, and that require some type of a procedure. And so in that scenario, you know, uh, you know, a, a tenodesis is something that we've utilized uh, that has been helpful. And then the, then the question is, what do you do in the combination? And do you address, you know, the superior labrum and repair the superior labrum if you think that it is functionally, biomechanically, functionally important for these throwers, which we would all agree. Uh, and if you think the biceps is functionally important, do you tenodesis it? And how does that alter it? And I know, you know, Peter, you've looked at this in, in a variety of, of studies, some clinical studies with maybe results that are um, less than what we would hope for. Um, but I, I still think that those are principles that we follow when addressing that combination of pathology, a clinically significant superior labral tear and clinically significant biceps, biceps damage. Yeah, we, you know, when Peter was with us, we, we did a couple of studies that looked at the role of the biceps in combination with superior labral pathology. The first was in a laboratory setting where we essentially created superior labral tears and then looked at how translation was affected. And as you would expect, uh, a superior labral tear increases translation. When you take the biceps, it doesn't make the translation any worse, but it doesn't correct it back to normal. 
And I do think that the abnormal translation is one of the, the reasons why these players decompensate because they get they go from normal contact between the humeral head and undersurface rotator cuff and the posterior superior labrum to abnormal contact because they can't keep the ball centered in the socket. So I do think if you if you think that that's a problem, repairing the labrum still needs to be part of your algorithm. I know you touched on this, Mike, earlier about some of the work that we did looking back at our our players that have undergone either tenodesis or tenodesis plus flap repair. And of course, there's been the major league data um, that was right. published by you know, and uh, and Brian, uh, excuse me, Brandon Erickson. You know, the mm-hmm. problem with all that is that it's retrospective studies without clear indications, meaning most of the MLB uh, data was a large number of revision players, it was older players, it was salvage surgery. So I think it's hard to draw meaningful conclusions from that. And similarly, in our data, it was you know, kind of a gestalt in terms of when a surgeon felt a repair was indicated, when a surgeon felt a, a tenodesis was indicated, and when a surgeon was felt that both was indicated. So I don't think we can throw the procedures out because of that data, but I, I do think it leads to us uh, concluding that we have to continue to get better at our decision-making about when each of these procedures is indicated. The last thing that I would just say is that, you know, part of the complexity here is we've had this argument clouded by the fact that many people now think that tenodesis is the right answer for slap tears, period. And I think that data is pretty clear as we start to get older, above 35, our, our laborers, you know, our weekend warriors, where frankly, probably we were over-treating slaps. And so what we've realized is that many of these slaps can be neglected and maybe doing the tenodesis is one of the ways for us to feel comfortable neglecting treating those slap pathology and dealing with other issues in the shoulder. But I want to make sure that people who are listening to this understand that that, that data that, that looks at labral um, repair versus biceps tenodesis is really not applicable at this time to the throwing. It's a separate category. Nick, Nick, that is, I agree with you completely. So important. I mean, the, the article that's classically quoted as Pasquale Boileau's article where he compared slap repairs with, with tenodesis and the overwhelmingly uh, better results were in the tenodesis group. But if you look at that, that study, which is often quoted, I mean, those patients, the average age of the slap patients were, was 37 and the average age of the tenodesis patients were 52. So that's not the population we're talking about, right, Nick? I mean, in the younger population, there are other studies that have shown that I mean, you, you, you can't throw out slap repair. I mean, you really have to consider it because of its biomechanical importance, the superior labrum. So I, I agree with you completely. Well, I wanted to thank both of you for coming on. I mean, this has been a real tour de force that just displays your depth of knowledge of this subject. I also want to thank you for coming and talking about a subject that I think is difficult for us as surgeons to talk about, in part because, as you just both mentioned, there's a lot we still don't understand about it. And a lot of what we still are doing is based upon our suppositions on biomechanical studies. We just don't have the perspective evidence that I think we would really need to make firm recommendations so I really appreciate both of your time. This has been awesome. You guys were great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Peter, I just want to make one comment. And I think about this often when I think about slaps, because I'm sure Nick can attest to this, that um, this is a really hard thing to, to, to vet out and determine the optimal treatment for these athletes. And, and I, I particularly like the Churchill quote, uh, Winston Churchill, where he says, success is going from failure to failure without a loss of enthusiasm. So I just think we need to we need to keep going here. We need to keep being meticulous and granular and eventually we'll we'll determine what is the optimal treatment, but I think we we have to continue to, you know, to remain enthusiastic when we look at this particular challenging problem. Yeah, it's it's unfortunately probably reflective of the sport of baseball as a whole, right? Mike, I mean the reality yeah. is um, for these players they fail 40% of the time, uh, 50% of the time. 60, 70% of the time when they're at the plate, uh, you know, and a good batting average is 30%. Fortunately, we do a little bit better than that, yeah. but we have a lot to learn in terms of making um, uh, success rates where we would prefer to see them for, the, for this level of athlete. Yeah, right. yeah, this is great. Rachel, Peter, thank you so much for having us. This was a, a really, a, it's just so great to discuss this. Great job, yeah, I'd like guys. To, Thanks for- I'd like to echo Pete and thank both of you for spending so much time with us and with our ASCS podcast listeners. Um, certainly a, a difficult topic, as Pete mentioned, for surgeons where we expect to and, and want to see success for our patients. And even with the best of intentions, the best of techniques and the best of rehab, this just doesn't always provide the best results for athletes when it comes to shoulder surgery and pitchers. So hopefully our listeners got a lot out of this. That is all the time we have for today's podcast. Again, we want to thank our guests so much for spending so much time and, and insight with us. And for all of our shoulder and elbow listeners out there, 
Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast. And for Pete Chalmers, I'm Rachel Frank, and we'll see you next time.